my daughter Amy one day said, Dad, you need a restaurant to put all this memorabilia in. And I said, you know what, you're probably right. Thus far, uh, we've got to keep up the good work, excellent service, food is really good here. Our chef, Mark, is uh, one of the best I've ever been around. So we plan on keeping, keeping it going well as long as we certainly can. Well, Coach, this is your Heisman Trophy. Back or out in front of us, we have Danny Werfel's Heisman Trophy. This has to be the only restaurant on earth with two Heisman trophies. So my question for you is, what's the different feelings you have winning that award as a player and coaching a player to winning the Heisman? Oh, it's certainly a, a wonderful individual thrill, but again, it is an individual award. If you said, would you have rather won the Heisman or the national championship, the national championship would be far ahead because it's a, football's a team sport, and uh, when you win a championship, you get to share it with the entire team. The guys that win the Heisman, we try to share it with our teammates and all this, that, and the other, but it is an individual award, and uh, I'm glad to go on the record books as having one. But I'm more proud of uh, these championship rings down here because uh, it reflects uh, a whole bunch of players and coaches that had uh, a very successful year. Coach, where amongst your career accomplishments does the ACC mm -hmm. title at Duke rank, and mm -hmm. is it a unique thing for you when you look back on it? This was a team uh, that really, I guess, sort of made my coaching career and really made Florida's coaching career the first uh, seven or eight years of the 90s. Uh, but the big game was the Duke 21, Clemson 17. That, that's the game that turned it around. And in fact, they, the students stormed the field there at Wallace Wade Stadium and at Duke, tore down the goalpost. Uh, you don't see that much anymore. And then uh, we beat NC State 35-26. They were a real good team that year. And that was crucial. And then the Tar Heels were not a very good team that year. So we beat them 41 to nothing. and it, should have been 60 to nothing. We, we sort of fiddled around a little bit in the fourth quarter. But anyway, uh, so I come to Florida after that game. And uh, at the time, Florida had zero SEC championships since 1933. Uh, but I inherited, uh, I call it a loaded team. They were ball players on defense, offensive line, everywhere. And we found a quarterback who was already here, Shane Matthews. And uh, we started winning SEC championships. Well, coach, the 1990 SEC mm -hmm. title, next to, next to it is the 89 Duke ball. Mm -hmm. So you came straight over, you win the SEC. Uh, of course, the Gators in 1984 were stripped of their first SEC title, mm -hmm. some say unfairly, mm -hmm. by the presidents. But you've always counted 1990. Why is that important to you to do that? Mark, in 1990, we started the season, we weren't on any kind of probation, but we were under investigation. And we'd already beaten Alabama and I think LSU or Mississippi State. And the violation occurred four years prior to any player or coach even arriving on campus. But uh, our university decided to accept the penalty, which meant we couldn't go to the Sugar Bowl as champion. And the Sugar Bowl got the champion in their game. They had to deal with them. So now they said, well, you guys can't win the SEC. Well, I said, yeah, we can win it. And the players, I mean, they were heartbroken. And we had a little talk, and I said, I guarantee all you guys right here today, if we win the SEC this year, I will always say that's our first. And I kept my word to the day, and I will to the day they put me under. That team won the SEC. I guarantee you, all of us on that 1990 team, it's in our record book. 
and it'll be in our record book forever. So I'm looking at the 1994 Florida Georgia game ball, 50 points in Athens, famously. Uh, I was at the cocktail party game yep. this year. Yep. Uh, the Georgia fans wanted more blood at the end of that game. Mm -hmm. Um, Ugga famously in your 66 season ended your perfect campaign and your SEC title hopes. Um, mm -hmm. Some say there's a connection there that for you, when you were coach at the Gators, the cocktail party was a little bit personal. So why is this ball here and, and what makes that an important uh, milestone for you or memento? Oh, it really isn't all that important. It really isn't. Uh, we went to Athens and played them in 95, actually, the year's wrong. Uh, uh, but at the end of the game, I think one of our assistant coaches, Lawson Holland, said, Coach, nobody's ever scored 50 here. And I said, well, we're way ahead. And we had our backup quarterback in, Eric Kresser. Travis McGriff was about our third-team receiver that year. He went on to be a, a first-teamer and, and played very well here. Uh, but we scored with a couple minutes left uh, to go over 50. And uh, it, it wasn't that big a deal, trust me. But... Uh, if we could tag one on the Bulldogs, we, we needed to. They had beaten us so many times in the past. They had owned us. And uh, if they can run it up on us, uh, they're free to go do it also. When you come to Coach's Restaurant, you're gonna see a display over here from Augusta National Golf Club, and you're gonna see a, a one on that scorecard. Coach, what was, the, what was the context of that round, and what's that hole in one like for a serious golfer like you? Uh, well, people always ask, have you ever played Augusta National? And I've said yes several times. I was fortunate. Uh, as coach of South Carolina, uh, there was a member of Augusta that invited me and a couple of coaches over every year. Uh, so I tell people I had a hole in one. And uh, they said, what hole, what hole? And when I say number seven, they say, wait a minute, that's a par four. I said, well, not on the par three course. So this ball uh, was uh, aced on, on the par three course, number seven there. I think I hit an eight iron from about 138 uphill a little bit. And uh, I remember the caddy said, uh, I think he went in, coach. And it, as you can see, it was just like that. It was in the shadows a bit. So you couldn't really see the ball go in much. And, uh, but it was in the jar and uh, we got, and that's the ball. Uh, we got it fixed up and put on the plaque there. And uh, Two Hall of Fame certificates. Coach, what are these all about here? Yeah, I guess uh, I've been sort of fortunate and blessed to be the only guy to do a bunch of things, this, that, and the other. But at the time, I'm the only living uh, person that uh, has in the Hall of Fame on both sides. The other three are Amos Alonzo Stagg, back in the 1900s, uh, Bobby Dodd, who uh, played at Georgia Tech and coached there, and Bowden White, who uh, was a Tennessee coach for quite a while. Those three also went in as player and coach. Some good company, huh? Well, I'm the only one still alive, so uh, <laughs> maybe someday there'll be one. I don't know. Not many uh, college All-Americans or Heisman guys uh, like that go into coaching. I was the only one dumb enough to do it, I guess, <laughs> but it worked out pretty well. So I told you I went to UCLA. Coach Wooden's an important part of my life, had a big impact on me. Can you describe what appealed to you about Coach Wooden and why you've looked to him for some coaching ideas, philosophy, et cetera? I think back in 1990 or 91, I just got the Florida job and a good friend of mine had gone to hear Coach Wooden speak in Nashville. And he, back then, you know, the little audio tapes, he, he sent me the tape and uh, I put it on and I wrote down about 36 principles of coaching that were on there. And I said, man, these all make sense to me. I'm gonna try to uh, really use these uh, as head coach here at Florida. And uh, when he was, uh, gosh, he was, I'm not sure how old he was, 94, nine, early 90s maybe. Uh, but one of his friends called me and said, here's his number. He'd love to hear from me, his birthday's today. So I called Coach Wooden and talked to him and told him that uh, I, I read your articles and I try to coach as much like you as I possibly can. And he said, I can tell because I've seen your teams play. So that was the best compliment as a coach I, I think I've ever had when John Wooden said, uh, I like the way your guys play. So uh, his, his philosophy was so simple and clean. It was that his players were just mentally taught to play the best they can. They didn't worry about who the opponent was. They didn't worry about what score was. Just play the best you can the whole game. That's all you have to think about. And, and don't, you know, don't make stupid mistakes, this, that, and the other. And, and that's the way they played the game. And uh, 
to win 10 national championships in 12 years. He had a lot of different players doing that. Uh, but the way they played the game and uh, was, was the way all, all sports should be played. Yeah, these are just a, a whole bunch of ball plays that obviously hit, uh, a lot of them for touchdowns, uh, that were crucial in, in a lot of our victories here at Florida. Uh, I think a few from uh, Duke and maybe even one or two from South Carolina. The fans, uh, they sort of get a kick out of a lot of these because they remember bunch of these plays. Did you draw these up? Is this your Yeah, I, I drew these up on uh, our play sheet. As you can see, we got hash marks. Uh, you always got to draw your hash marks up. Actually, this game was 1991, uh, 1991 uh, against San Jose State. And uh, we had the largest crowd in the history of the state of Florida at this game because our stadium just got large uh, prior to this season. I think we had 85,000 for Florida versus San Jose State. So that's how the Gators loved football back in the day. And that was a play uh, where we'd block everybody, only send two guys out. Uh, San Jose was a big blitz team. And when we played those big blitz teams, we just stack everybody up, say, come on and rush, one-on-one, and, -on -one, and away we go. So that was what that, that play was right there. What I wanted to ask, Coach, when you were drawing plays, were, were, you a, were you a technical guy? Were you thinking technically, was it more of a feel? Did you consider drawing plays a creative endeavor in certain ways? We had plays that were really designed uh, for the correct defense to throw against. Uh, so sometimes you had to audible if you don't get the right defense. Uh, and we had a few adjustments. But uh, back when I coached, the other team would pretty much show you what their coverage is. 3D, 2D, blitz, man-to-man. -man. Well, just briefly, I always believe throwing is similar to hitting a baseball. So if a guy is looking at the pitcher, he doesn't hold his bat right here. He holds it, holds it back a little bit off his right pet up in here. Some like holding it a little higher. Danny liked it up here. Shane and Rex and some of those guys were just more right here, but not here. But the guys that hold it here, they have to they have to pull. But from here, you step and throw. So anyway, of course, we did that every day, all day, ball position, steps, head position, and all that, which uh, I don't know how many coaches teach that today. Very few, I think. Hey, Coach, do me a favor. Point this at me and just get me in the frame. So one thing I noticed, I found an old video of you teaching quarterbacks. Mm -hmm. And ball here, but I also noticed almost like Ted Williams, there was a little bit further torque back. And what I wanted to ask you is as a former quarterback, that looked to me like not only is the ball in a position to throw, but you're also a little coiled in the midsection. Exactly. So as you come through, mm -hmm. boom, you yeah. can fire it off with a lot of upper body twist. Is that, was that right to that's, notice that? That's exactly right. The more coil you got, you know, you don't have any coil here, but here you do. So just that little call, you're already you're ready to step and throw. Mm -hmm. Exactly. No question about it. So, so Coach, you're known for your visors. What do we got here? Well, I was you know, fortunate enough that I played a lot of golf in the offseason. And uh, I was fortunate that we did some Ireland golf trips uh, up to New York and Long Island. And I had the opportunity to play some of the really great golf courses in America and overseas. And I'd always try to collect a visor from a, a really nice golf course. And then of course we got all the, my, the schools I coached at, Duke, uh, South Carolina, and uh, Florida. But uh, so this is the collection and uh, we decided to call the rooftop bar visors. So this is the group of visors it's named for right here. How many are in here? You have any idea? Uh, uh, I don't know how many, how many in here? How many? 144. That's what 144 visors looks like. Yeah.